Yes, sir. My trigger. Back up in this thing, man. Today, I'm reacting to some scary and creepy TikTok videos to not watch before you go to bed. But before we hop into that, man, go ahead and smash the like button right now so we can run the numbers up on this video. And if you haven't already, man, go ahead and sub up, man. The community is lit. I promise you. Join up, man. I appreciate everybody who subbed so far. Thank you guys so much for joining this community and helping me build it from the ground up. So without further ado, let's hop straight into the video. The most haunted object in the world. Annabelle was a raggedy doll with a dark past, first given as a gift to a nursing student. The owner complained that she would find the doll, moved around the house constantly, would find notes written by what she thought was the doll, and would even come home to find the doll covered in blood. Once, when a friend was staying over, he woke up the next morning, covered in scratches and blood, and they knew they had a problem Ed and Lorraine Warren famed demonologist tried two exorcisms on the doll believing that Annabelle was being used by a demon as a conduit from hell when the war warrens realized that they were unable to send the demon home they took it upon themselves to jail annabelle for protection from the rest of the world she remains there still in the warrens museum where she lies encased in a glass box with multiple warnings multiple locks insisting to never let her free again bro there's probably so many people out there that would pay top dollar to get that doll too that's what's so sick about the world right now Y'all know the story of Osama bin Laden? Oh, not the human, but there was an animal that caught so many bodies that it was nicknamed after him. Back in 2004, villagers <laughs> in a district in India were being terrorized by probably the worst thing to have beef with other than OG Sama. A 10 foot tall rogue bull elephant. It started with the elephant destroying crops and damaging buildings while also smoking anyone who attempted to protect their property. Anyone who did got dealt with violently. And unlike almost any other <laughs> elephant, Osama had no fear of fire or firecrackers. And even though he was literally the biggest op a human can have, he managed to avoid being captured or cornered by constantly <laughs> moving around. Which was how 4-ton Osama the Elephant managed to stay on the lam for about 2 years. Damn. All while leasing coffins to anyone brave enough to F around and unlucky enough to find out. It got so bad that they actually put a bounty on his head with the government issuing a shoot to kill order. Which they finally managed to do and the hunter that did it said the bull kept charging him even as he was emptying the clip on him to the point where he was about a few yards away from becoming a chalk outline. Here's the messed up part though. There's a good number of people that'll tell you that they took out a random innocent elephant. Meaning that this was the one Osama that was never caught and that his estimated body count of 27 could actually be higher. Moral of this video? If I had a nickel for every homicidal elephant named after Osama, I'd have two nickels. It's not a lot, but it's a lot more than I should have. You don't want no funk with Osama. Osama has dealt with every single op. Osama is smoking on op packs still to this day. Homicidal pedophiles in world history. And this guy was a rock star. This story is extremely disturbing. So all of the bad things that Gary Glitter had done in the past resurfaced in 2019 when the Joker came out. His song was the one that was used during this infamous dancing stairway scene. But let's rewind. Paul Francis Gad was born in 1944 in England. It was in the year 1971 during the glam rock movement when Paul began to use the stage name Gary Glitter and his career really took off. The release of his album titled Glitter was a massive success. The song Rock and Roll reached high points on all charts across the world and he seemed to be this, you know, new age progressive rock and roll star. And for years, Gary was heralded as a rock and roll icon. This guy was loved by thousands, millions of people across the planet. But that would all change in the year 1997 when Gary took his computer into a repair shop in England. The technician at the time that was taking a look at Gary's laptop discovered CP images on his hard drive. The police then got involved, they searched his home and found even more CP. This guy was sick. After all was said and done, it was discovered that Gary had downloaded over 4,000 images of CP onto his computer. He had also had a relationship with a 14-year-old girl in the 1970s, and he was given a four-month prison sentence. After he was released from prison, Gary felt the heat from the public now hating him in England, so he fled to another country. But after the authorities in Cambodia discovered who he was, he was exposed, and he was then deported to Bangkok. He eventually settled, though, in Vietnam. And it was in Vietnam where Gary resumed his typical pedo behaviors. He was banned from a nightclub for groping a teenage waitress. Other people saw him bringing two young girls into his home. And on November 12, 2005, Gary fled his home in Vietnam. Authorities eventually searched the place and found a 15-year-old girl that was living with him. He then tried to escape the country, but he was arrested at the airport. And from that point on, multiple Vietnamese girls came forward that were underage and said that Gary Glitter had, you know, assaulted them in the past. After all was said and done, he was sentenced to about three years in prison in Vietnam. And if he would have been convicted on all the charges that he faced, he might have been executed by firing squad. 
Eventually, though, he served his sentence and he was released in Vietnam. And after a lot of countries said they wouldn't let Gary Glitter in, he returned home to the UK. But he wasn't safe there. He was arrested shortly after arriving back in the UK after he faced a number of new allegations against him. Wow. Eventually, he was charged with eight counts of sexual offenses against girls from the ages of 12 to 14 in the years 1977 to 1980. One of these charges alleged that he even crept into a 10-year-old girl's bed and attempted to essay her. So after a lengthy trial, he was finally caught again. He was imprisoned, but he could be released next year in 2023. I know that the movie The Joker received a lot of backlash for using Gary Glitter's song because he was compensated with royalties, even after all of these things that happened to him. And yeah, this just shows that this guy was not and is not a good dude. Most unusual deaths wow. in human history. Gary Glitter. Anthony Hensley was kayaking across a pond in Illinois when he accidentally got too close to a swan's nest. While trying to row away, he fell off his kayak and the swan drowned him underwater. <laughs> A 14-year-old boy from Texas was playing hide-and-go-seek at 3 in the morning. While trying to run around, he couldn't see all that well and ran face-first into a bull statue. Wanting to reap the benefits of cold exposure, Chelsea Aki Salvation decided to try out cryotherapy. However, during her session, the machine was set incorrectly, causing all oxygen to be eliminated inside the chamber, suffocating her to death. King Henry I died after eating too many lampreys, a type of jawless fish. In 2013, Ooh. the corpse of 17-year-old Kendrick Johnson was found rolled up in a gym mat at his high school. Police originally concluded that he had tried to grab his shoe and became trapped, but in 2021, the case was reopened and is believed to be a murder. The most haunted place on earth. Pavelia is an infamous island in Italian history. Once served crawled up in the mat to grab his shoe are you kidding me <laughs> are you kidding he was rolled up like a cigarillo no way foul play um oh young delay okay serving as the quarantine zone and mat at his high school wanted place on earth is reopened and is believed to be a murder the most haunted place on earth. Pavelia is an infamous island in Italian history, once serving as the quarantine zone and final resting place for victims of the Black Plague. Oftentimes these people would be sent away without even being truly sick, dooming them to a horrific fate. It's said that over 50% of the island's soil is made of burned human ash, haunted ground. In the early 19th century, the island was converted from a quarantine zone to a mental asylum because apparently being host to one horror setting just wasn't quite enough. The asylum didn't do much to improve. Pavelia's haunted reputation instead of being home to the sick now the island was home to droves of mentally disturbed patients being made into victims by the doctor's sick experiments. Doctors that the asylum would impose lobotomies under their patients with no concerns for sanitations or the victim's safety. With chisels drills and rarely using anesthetic making Pavelia the I'm just glad we live in the modern age. I'm glad we live in 2023. Shit was so hellish back then. I could not imagine living back then where shit was so archaic and shit. So glad we grew out of that. Pansies in the entire world. The group is known as the Ngogo Chimps, and if you wanted to visit them in person, which most definitely you would not want to do that, you would have to visit the Ugandan Rainforest. This group has been known to wage war against other neighboring groups of chimps, and they have completely conquered the territory. And go-go chimps, along with expanding their territory vastly by killing other groups of chimps, they've grown their population to around 200. They do exhibit somewhat of cannibalistic tendencies. In this photo right here, this guy is eating part of another monkey that the entire group had captured. And there's actually a video about this as well. However, I'm not showing that here because that would get taken down. With that being Wicked. said, though they're very ruthless, they have exhibited a softer side and shown more emotions than just anger. However, this doesn't take away from the fact that they are extremely aggressive and will kill anything standing in their path or within their territory. Would you Follow pet it? For the next video. The story of Resurrection Mary. Resurrection Mary is a famous ghost story about Archer Avenue in Chicago, Illinois. According to the legend, there have been numerous sightings of a ghostly young woman near Resurrection Cemetery wearing a long, white, flowing gown. Back in 1930, a young woman named Mary attended a dance and had an argument with her boyfriend. Mary ran out into the night 
and hitchhiked down Archer Avenue on that cold winter night. She was hit by a car and killed on impact. The driver fled the scene of the accident. Mary was buried in Resurrection Cemetery, and ever since then, her ghost has been spotted walking down Archer Avenue and also at the ballroom where she danced that fateful night. People who see Resurrection Mary say she is a young blonde-haired, blue-eyed girl, dressed in a long white ball gown and dancing shoes. Some drivers have actually stopped and let her into their cars. They say her skin is cold and clammy to touch. She always asks them to let her out at the cemetery gates and then suddenly disappears into thin air. In 1976, a passerby called the police after noticing a woman who appeared to be locked inside Resurrection Cemetery. When the police arrived, the woman was nowhere to be seen, but there was physical evidence that the bars on the gate were bent apart. Not only that, her ghostly handprints were embedded in the bar. All right, what's the minimum amount? you would take to go scoop up Resurrection Mary and take her to the cemetery? Let me know in the comments. I think for me, like dead ass, like a real ghost, I think for me about like, I'll do it for like 1500. Fuck it. I'll do it for like 500 to be real. I'll do it for like 100 bucks. Michael Guider from Australia, one of the worst pedophiles in world history. He's also a murderer and he's also out free in the world right now. Michael Guider was born in 1950 in Australia and he had a really rough childhood. For a while, when he was a kid, he lived at a boy's home where he was subjected to sexual assault. And he even later told prison psychologists that his own mother had sexually assaulted him when he was a child. Damn. In his younger years, Michael worked as a gardener. He became an expert on Aboriginal culture. And one of the first crimes that he ever committed was when he set his ex-girlfriend's shop on fire. But as he got older, Michael's urges became too strong for him to resist. And this picture taken from the height of his crime spree where he's holding this file of photos is deeply disturbing. You see, in 1996, Michael was charged and convicted of 60 counts of child sexual abuse. Basically, what he would do is befriend women who had children, then he would act like a babysitter, go over to the house, watch the kids, but while the parents were gone, Michael would give the kids sleeping drugs. He would then repeatedly assault them and photograph the whole process. This dude was really, really sick. But when he was finally arrested in 1995, he actually wasn't arrested for any of those activities. He was arrested this time for fondling two seven-year-old girls. While in prison, Michael was beaten two times, almost to death. He suffered a lot of fractures in his bones and, and stuff like that. But it's at this point in the story when the attention was turned on a Samantha Knight, a young girl him? who had been missing for over a decade. Samantha was only nine years old when she went missing back in the year 1986, but after his arrest, a friend of Michael's came forward and told authorities that he had been talking about Samantha in this weirdly obsessive way in the past. Oh, and shit. while at first he denied ever knowing Samantha, eventually Michael admitted to giving the young girl that same drug cocktail that he gave all of his victims. Oh, he claimed shit. that this drug cocktail had gone wrong and he actually ended up accidentally killing young Samantha. But the thing is, when investigators asked him what he did with her body, he just claimed that he forgot what had happened. To this day, nobody has been able to find the body of Samantha Knight. She's still out there somewhere in Australia. And Michael knows where she is, there's no doubt in my mind, but he just won't tell anybody. It's horrific. Now, there are a number of other disappearances that Michael that may be fuck. linked to, like that of Renee Aitken, who disappeared around the same time frame in 1984. But then here comes the bombshell at the end of the story. In 2019, Michael was released from prison. He served 17 years for killing nine-year-old Samantha Knight and for those 60 counts of child sexual abuse, but he's now out on the streets. There were obviously massive protests and people were very against the release of Michael, but due to technicalities, he got out and he's still out. Now, I read oh some reports God. that in October of this year, the police checked up on Michael and they found a lot of images of CP on his phone and, and in his course. home, so he was rearrested and all of this, but he's still out on the streets. He's not back in the system yet. And I think it's just horrific that Samantha Knight's body has never been found. This is part one of it's ranking the up, most bro. disturbing Creepy shit. In part one, we'll be talking about Gaston from Beauty and the Beast. This first scene was a close call, however the Beast let him live. Like most villains though, Gaston remained evil and attacked the Beast after he showed him mercy, and then he ended up falling to his death in a pretty gruesome way down this massive chasm. There's actually a crazy Easter egg here though. For two frames while Gaston is falling, you can see skulls in his eyes indicating that he definitely died. In terms of being gruesome Damn. and disturbing, I would probably rate this a seven out of 10, maybe an eight out of 10 though, because of the skulls in the eye. Follow for the next part. A Wisconsin Damn. nurse cut off a man's foot after explicitly being told not to. 
In March of this year, a man in his 60s fell in his home. Because the heat wasn't turned on and he couldn't get up, he got frostbite on his foot. His right foot specifically was only attached to his leg by a tendon and two inches of skin. So he was admitted to the Spring Valley Health and Rehab Center. Months later, on May 27th, a nurse changed his foot bandages. She said he could wiggle his toes, so keep that in mind. Later that day, Mary Kay Brown got to work, and she told other nurses that she was going to cut off this man's foot for his own comfort. The nurses and other higher-ups were like, don't do that. So not only was she not authorized to do this, she wasn't qualified, but this nurse chose to go ahead and do it. Another what? nurse said that after the amputation, he told her he could feel everything and that it hurt really bad. Nurse Mary also told fellow colleagues that she wanted to display this man's foot at her family's taxidermy shop, also with a sign that says, wear your boots, kids. And within a week of the amputation, the 62-year-old man was dead. This month, Mary Brown was charged with elderly abuse and mayhem, and she could face decades in prison. Her next court date is December 4th. That's probably the most disturbing thing I ever heard. Who authorized a nurse to cut off my fucking foot? My malpractice suit is about to be through the roof. The drip is about to be incredible. This island has one of the most disturbing histories in America, and no one really knows the full truth behind it. So like I said before, this island was owned by multi-millionaire Francis Sheldon, pictured right here. And Francis and a number of other local men from Michigan, including this guy, Gerald S. Richards, ran a boys camp on the island. They would fly kids to the island on this airstrip, kids from the YMCA and other schools and communities in the area. Not and both good. the children and the parents of the children who attended this boys camp were told that this was an island of fun where kids could relax. They had big brothers there. It was going to be totally safe. And this camp ran on this island for a period of years. Then one day, some of the kids who attended the camp began to tell their parents that the counselors or the teachers, the adults that were there on the island, had behaved with them in very, very inappropriate ways. They began telling their friends and parents that they were taken into these cabins pictured here on the island. They were assaulted. They were told to remove all of their clothing and that there were cameras all over the place. Well, it turns out that this guy, the multi-millionaire with political and business connections in the area, Francis Sheldon, was running a massive CP ring. And they had been abusing the children on this island under the guise of bringing them to a boys camp for years, recording all of it, selling it across the world. And some of the more affluent clients of their business were even allowed to take trips to the island themselves to see some of these young boys. Now, this story bears an obvious resemblance to the story of Jeffrey Epstein, but there are some very, very strange things that are happening here that nobody knows about and the government still refuses to talk about to this day. So let's talk about this guy, Gerald S. Richards. He was a gym teacher at a local Catholic school who went down for the crimes and he was heavily involved with every aspect of this business, if you know what I mean. Well, it seems like through he his looks political creepy. and business connections, Francis Sheldon was actually tipped off that he was about to be arrested and raided and charged with these horrific crimes. So Francis, before he could be brought to justice for these crimes, he actually fled the country in a personal plane. He then moved to France, got remarried, and died in Amsterdam, and never had to pay for any of the crimes that were committed here. Wow. But it's when we start talking about the murders that this story really starts to blow my mind. So take a good look at this guy, Chris Bush. This oh, is Christopher shit. Bush's father, Harold Lee Bush. Now, he was an executive with General Motors, and the family was obviously extremely wealthy. They were politically connected, and they were very connected to every business in the area. These guys had a lot of power. But back to Christopher Bush. This guy had assaulted a number of children. He'd been let out of prison, let out of jail in a very, very suspicious way, multiple times, put on bail for serious offenses. And he was a alleged associate of the crime ring that was happening on North Fox Island. Meaning that, like I said earlier, he was one of those people who could afford to actually fly out to the island to do things himself. I'm out of time. Follow for part three. This is where it gets juicy. Kind of makes me happy that I don't have kids because I, I would just fucking go absolutely ape shit if somebody ever did that to me i'll be up at that camp shit i'm i'm actually dropping my kids off hell no i'm dropping my kids off boy these things are oddly terrifying in at number one this octopus here with 32 different tentacles was found off the coast of south korea what i don't know what type of genetic mutation is going on here but this thing is freaky looking in at number two, we have this giant statue of baby Jesus. However, it's kind of hard to see how large this thing is until you see the guy sitting down here at the bottom. So this guy <laughs> is barely the size of one of the baby's shins, so this thing is a big no for me. And finally, in at number three, going off of the baby theme, this person's knees look like 
babies' heads were implanted inside of them. <sighs> if I saw these things walking my way, I'd be turning around. The 1987 Christmas Rampage. Hi, my name is Ethan, and trigger warning, this is a dark... Hey, I'm sorry, I gotta pause right now. This head. Oh my god. He is thinking up a diabolical plan. Alright. Dark case. On December 28th, 1987, Ronald Gene Simmons walked into a law firm in Russellville, Arkansas, where he shot at a receptionist that he was infatuated with. However, she didn't like him in return. Then he went into an office building of an oil company and shot two executives, unaliving one and injuring the other. He then drove to a convenience store and a former place of work and shot two more people. However, thankfully they both survived. And the last place he went to was a Woodline Motor Freight Company where he shot a woman. However, she did survive as well. After all Crazy. these brutal attacks were committed, he then sat down and waited for police to arrest him. His motive was unknown. However, he was sentenced to death and then unalived on June 24th. Fifth, Here is what your birthmark says about your past Crazy life. Fuck. And let me know which birthmark you have in the comments. If you don't have a birthmark at all, that either means you've died of natural causes in your past life, but you never had a past life. So essentially, this is your first life. Basically, you're brand new. Do you have a red birthmark anywhere on your body? That means fire had a part to play in taking you out of your last life. If you have a spot on your eye, all I can say is damn, because this is from a spear wound when someone killed you in your sleep. Now, if you have freckles anywhere on your body, that shows you where you've been burned in your past life and basically serves as a reminder to not make the same mistake again. But tell me, do you have damn. a brown birthmark? If you do, that's the area you were shot in your past life. And every brown birthmark equals another shot. If you have a birthmark on your ear, if you have a birthmark on your ear, it means you were incredibly wealthy in your past life. And if you have birthmarks on both your ears, it means you're going to be incredibly successful in this one. Fuck! And finally, if you have a birthmark on the side of your nose, it means you actually killed someone in your past life because of rage. Everybody oh, with me? Shit. Yeah. I don't have any of those. Fuck. Back with killer cases with the crystal pusher, and I would like to talk about this uninhabited home. Now, it's not the nicest, obviously, but it has an insane story attached. Actually, sick, deplorable behavior. It's in Indianapolis, and it belongs to Leander and his wife Betty Bradley, who are the grandparents of Ken and Carrie Allen. And Sharon was their mother. She divorced from their father after years of fighting when Ken was 14 and Carrie was four, and the two just decided to split up their kids. So Sharon kept Carrie and Ken moved to Florida with his father. And living with Sharon on her own, Carrie ended up being very coddled and codependent on her mother. And then Ken had some behavioral issues living with his father in Florida. As Ken grew into adult age, he just constantly got into legal trouble with theft, counterfeit, things like that he had a severe gambling addiction as well now, he looks like a kid often bail him out whenever he got into trouble whether it be sending him money or literally bailing him out of jail but then he ended up arrested and sentenced to 14 months in prison and at that time they decided it was time to cut him off and he constantly spoke with Carrie and Sharon while he was incarcerated, explaining that he had this big grand idea to make their lives better once he was released from prison. And once he did get released, he went back to Indiana to live with his mother Sharon and his sister Carrie. So when he does get home, he immediately tells Carrie upon the day of his release what his plan was exactly. So the plan actually was to murder his grandparents. He knew they had about 200000 stored at their home and what on top fuck. of credit cards and other assets. So he's like, let's take them out. I want mom to help too. And Carrie's like, bet, let's do it. So on December 30th, 2004, Ken approached his mother with his plan. Like, hey, let's kill your mom and dad because we can just steal their money and that way we'll have a better life. Sharon's like, um, no way, I'm not killing my parents. What right. the hell is wrong with you? And Ken's like, okay, bet. He said, get down or lay down. So he talks to Carrie and he's like, hey, you know, mom actually isn't down like I thought she would be. So unfortunately, she got to go too. Yep. And Carrie's like, okay, bet. So around 9 p.m. that night, Carrie goes into the living room. She turns the TV volume all the way up and then goes into her mother's bedroom where her mother is sleeping. And then Ken follows behind her. He goes and sits on top of their mother and puts a pillow over her face to smother her and then decides to stab her through the pillow multiple times until she was no longer alive. This is literally the tip of the iceberg in this story. Like I haven't even, I haven't even stepped my foot in the water. So please. Could this be a gateway to another crazy. world? Tales of haunted places of mysterious phenomenon have always intrigued us. Have you heard about the Kiyotaki Tunnel in Kyoto, Japan? 
It's known to be one of the most haunted spots in all of Japan. This tunnel was built by slaves during the 1920s and it's said that those who drive through it can hear women screaming from a nearby forest and experience certain fatigue, headaches, and nausea. This is such a good idea. Let's see how many I can do in one video. These are the cases of all seven women on death row in Texas. This is Erica Shepard. As a child, she was physically abused as well as essayed and this continued her whole life until she was arrested. She was abused so horribly that it actually led to her getting brain damage as well as PTSD and a psychologist tested her and showed that she only has the mental capacity of a 14 year old. Most In her people. older teenage years, she was living with her brother and their roommate James and when Erica was 19, her and James came up with a plan to steal a car to go to Bay City to visit some friends. They decided to look in the apartment complex that they lived in, and while they were looking, they found a woman, Marilyn Mayer, and she was a mom of two and a real estate agent. Marilyn was moving things from her car to her apartment, and she left her apartment door open, and when she wasn't looking, Erica and James went in her apartment and waited for her to come back. When she got back into the apartment, they demanded her keys and she refused, and that's when James got really mad. He went and told Erica to go get a butcher knife. And Erica did. Wow. She went and got the knife and James stabbed Marilyn five times in the throat, put a plastic bag around her head and then hit her head with a 10 pound statue. And Jesus. then they fled to Bay City in Marilyn's car and one of Marilyn's daughters found her body. Soon after, they were arrested and sentenced with the death penalty in 1995. Erica is still sitting on death row right now, but James died in 1999 from AIDS. And this is a picture of Marilyn and one of her daughters. The next woman that's currently on death row is Darlie Routier. In 1996, Darlie called 911 and said that there was an intruder in her house with a knife and that he was attacking her sons. When police got there, six-year-old Devin was pronounced dead at the scene, but five-year-old Damon was still alive, so they rushed him to the hospital, but unfortunately he died during transport. Damn. Darlie had some wounds too. They definitely weren't that deep, but they did look pretty bad. But they were just seen by investigators as being superficial. When investigators were looking around, they did see a cut through one of the garage window screens as well as a sock that had blood from both the boys. When Darlie was talking to the police, she said that she was chasing the intruder through the kitchen and out the garage where he then escaped. The more the investigators looked at the evidence, the more it pointed to Darlie, so they arrested her and charged her with the murder of her two sons. Fuck, Darlie's Darlie. trial was a month long and she was sentenced in 1997 with the death penalty at the age of 27. During the trial, Darlie's defense attorney said that she didn't have any reasons or motives, but the prosecution was pushing the fact that she had a motive for money as well as attention. However, at the time, Darlie was really big in writing journal entries, and in a lot of them, she just wrote about how depressed she was and said that she just couldn't fight anymore. And she often wrote her thoughts about murder in the journals as well. Hey, man, it's, it's kind of sad that a lot of people who are in the criminal justice system have, like, the mental capacity of, like, teenagers or, or kids, bro. It's like a lot of that population is made up of that kind of demographic, bro. It's insane, bro. Tell me what y'all think about that, or am I just tripping? The biggest known things in our universe. What you're looking at on the screen right now is the largest black hole that we currently know about in our known universe. And right in the middle of this black hole, right around here, that's our solar system. Now this black hole weighs 40 billion solar masses, and for those of you that don't know what a solar mass is, one solar mass is equivalent to 333,000 Earths. So just to put it into perspective, this would be 333,000 times 40 billion. The diameter of this black hole is also massive at 240 billion kilometers, which is just absolutely ridiculous. If you try to think about it, it's impossible. Follow for the next part. How That's young so is the world's youngest serial killer? 20? 18? Even 15? This age reveal at the end of the story will shock you. Amarjeet Sada killed three people in separate incidences between 2006 and 2007, including two family members. This story takes place in India, and we're going to start in 2007 with a missing baby. A young woman had left her six-month-old baby in the care of a primary killer. school, and when she had come back, the baby was missing. Now, of course, immediately this baby's family was frantic, and they all began pointing fingers at one individual, Amarjeet Sada. They're quoted as having said they knew he had a dark streak and he was not like the other boys his age. Villagers called the police and said, you need to speak to this boy. And the police initially dismissed them saying, there's no way a boy that young is gonna know anything about that missing baby. Ultimately, the police listened to the villagers and tried to speak with Sada, and his parents were hesitant to let him speak to the police. 
And the disturbing fact is, the reason the parents were hesitant to let their son speak to the police was because they already knew that the boy had killed his cousin and his baby sister. They didn't bother getting the police involved with that, even knowing what their son had done because it was a family matter. But eventually, after pressure from the police, Sada's parents did let him speak to the police. And it was at this point that Amarjeet Sada admitted to the police what he had done. While in police custody, Amarjeet was very cool, very collected, even asked for a biscuit at one point before telling the police that he had in fact snuck into the daycare where the baby was sleeping, took the baby out of the crib and out into the woods where he brutally beat her with a brick and strangled her. He also admitted to having killed his eight-month-old baby sister in the same fashion, as well as his six-year-old cousin. The father of this six-year-old cousin was one of the family members who kept Sada's crimes under wraps. Family loyalty was obviously a big deal. Sada needed family. a fucking weapon. But again, with the outcry for this baby infant to be found, they could no longer keep a lid on this, and the monster that this boy was came to light. And the shocking truth is, this boy was only seven years old. This young boy was a certifiable psychopath. He smiled all through his police interrogation, had zero remorse for what he had done, and had taken a chilling delight in the pain that he caused these children before he ultimately killed them. India does not allow children to be sentenced to death or to even be jailed, and so he was Damn. put into a children's home until he turned 18. Sada was released, and to this day, he is unaccounted for and on the loose. That's actually surprising, because Indian parents usually have the chanclas on deck for that ass, boy. Let's talk about what happened to 13-year-old Rachel Mellon Skimp. She was born on October 13th of 1982 and lived in Melrose Park in Illinois. At the age of three, her parents divorced and her dad moved to Dallas and her mom stayed with her in Illinois. Eventually, her mom started seeing a man named Vincent and eventually they got married and had two children together. Rachel was described as a bubbly person with a great sense of humor. She was the life of the party and was always the most beautiful girl in the room. On January 30th of 1996, Rachel was at school and was having a normal school day. And as the day went on, her friends noticed that she was crying by her locker. So they went to go ask what was wrong. She said she was having a problem, but that she was going to fix it herself. And that is all she said. The following day on Wednesday, January 31st, Rachel decided to stay home from school because she was having a sore throat and was feeling kind of sick. So her mom left to work and her stepfather was going to stay home because he wasn't working at the moment. Rachel called her grandma to thank her for the Christmas gifts that she had sent her. And this call took like from four to five minutes. And her grandma said that this phone call was completely normal, nothing out of the ordinary, but she did notice that at one part in the phone call, Rachel was kind of quiet and her grandma said, is he there? Referring to her stepfather. And she said, yes. And then Rachel told her grandmother that she needed to hang up. Her stepfather stated that they played the Nintendo before she decided to go up to her room and take a nap. Oh, so when she was upstairs taking a nap, he decided to take the family dog for a walk, even though it was 20 degrees below zero. So he left at 2.30 p.m. and then ended up coming at 3 p.m. He said the reason that he took a while is because the dog broke free from the leash and he was not able to get him, so he just figured that the family dog would just find his way back eventually. At 3.15 p.m., Vincent's youngest daughter comes home and she goes straight to Rachel's room to greet her, and that's when she realizes that Rachel's not even there. So the youngest daughter tells her dad that it seems that Rachel is missing, that she's not even in her room, but he just doesn't seem to care. So once her mom gets home, the youngest daughter tells her that Rachel's missing from her room. So that is when her mom decides to call 911 and report her as missing. Stay tuned for part uh, two. The story was too elaborate. The cops would never believe that story. But if they did, then damn, walking a damn dog, 20 degrees, negative 20 degrees. All right, let's talk about urban legends from New York. We're going to be talking about Plum Island and the Montauk Monster. In 2008, this creature washed up onto the shore of Montauk. Everyone went oh. absolutely crazy oh. because look at this thing. Obviously, it's unlike oh. anything we've ever seen before. It has the body of like a pig with a beak on it. There were already suspicions that weird things were happening on Plum Island because it was an island for animal testing. This island is owned by Homeland Security and you cannot go to it. Eventually, experts decided this is a water-degraded raccoon, but many people didn't buy that at all. Other experts from university started to debunk this. Some didn't believe it was a raccoon because it was too long and the head shape is off. 
A lot of others speculated it was a sea turtle, but that was impossible because the turtles are fused to their shells. And they also don't have fur or teeth like this monster does here. Experts argued back and forth, but some still claim it's a raccoon today. This incident left tons raccoon. of speculations on Plum Island and what's going on over there. Many people made the comparison to Stranger Things Laboratory doing experiments and yep. Plum Island because <laughs> of this incident. Feel free to chime in in the comments. Have you ever heard of That's the urban legend saying. Polybus? It is said to be one of the most sinister video games that never existed. Set in an arcade in Portland, Oregon during the 1980s, this vector graphic game involved players shooting geometric shapes while sounds and objects flashed on screen. There have been reports that it caused side effects such as headaches, migraines, seizures, and even suicide. Even more mysteriously, mysterious men in black were said to make frequent visits to inspect Bolivia's machine before taking notes and leaving without a word. After a few months, it is rumored that the machine was quietly removed from all arcades in Portland without explanation. The company behind Sinus Solutions, translated in English as Three Deprivation, had ties to psychological government experiments conducted at the time. 100%. 100%. And that's all I'm going to say. But with that being said, guys, that was it. Thank you guys for coming to hang out with me. Thank you for coming to kick it. And until next time, man, y'all take it easy. Peace.